I can still viscerally feel what it felt like to get that call. I can, I can actually hear my doctor's voice in my head and I can feel how my body went cold. I'm Danielle Sepulveris and when I was 24 years old, I was diagnosed with HPV. I was considered high risk with precancerous cells. What it does is uh, cause precancerous cells on your cervix and these cells can progress into a cancerous state or they can clear on their own. My first irregular pap test came about during my regular annual visit, which I didn't think anything of because it was just my regular annual visit and I had no symptoms or any sort of issues that I was going in for. And after I went in a couple of days later, my doctor called and said that my test had come back irregular and that I need to come back in for another one. And then I went to get a biopsy and that confirmed my diagnosis. They did think that I was high risk at a certain point, which was why they moved ahead with cryosurgery twice to try to remove the cells. Once I got the results of that, that, that the second round also uh, didn't work. Uh, they scheduled the LEAP procedure. The LEAP was something that they had wanted to use as a last resort for me because I was uh, 24, not even 25 at the time. And uh, they said that removing a piece of your cervix is something that could affect you later in life. You know, so that was kind of terrifying and also uh, it made me angry that, you know, this, this thing that is so common is, you know, wreaking such havoc. So they removed uh, the tip of my cervix, which officially is what got rid of the precancerous cells. Even after I got a pap test that was all clear after the LEAP procedure, they still suggested getting tested every six months just in case, which I appreciate because I'd rather err on the side of caution uh, when it comes to taking care of my health. I think everything from the two years leading up to that sort of rushed in and hit me emotionally and I actually let myself feel. I don't know that I've ever felt more alone than I did in my entire life during those two years because I, I even went to some of my initial doctor's visits alone because I hadn't told anyone, no family members, no friends. I discovered that I can ask for help and it's okay to ask for help, whether it's emotional help or physical help, that there's, there's no weakness in admitting that you're not okay and that you need to talk to someone and that something's going on with you and you need support. Since then, now I've had 14 years now of all clear uh, pap tests when I go to the doctor and clear HPV tests. After it was over, I kept thinking if there's even one person who could feel less alone going through it because I talk about it, then that would be worth it to me. It, it's so bizarre that you can feel perfectly fine and something could be going on inside your body without you even knowing. And that's, that's actually really scary when you think about it. I've met so many people now who have dealt with similar situations as me or varying diagnoses within the same realm. And they all can say exactly what strain they had or exactly what type of cells. So I feel that it's helpful that everything's gotten so much more specific because everyone is different. The fact that labs now have much more accurate testing with much more rapid results uh, is what's going to continue to save lives down the line. Laboratory tests were incredibly important and essential to my journey because without them, I wouldn't have known anything that was going on, knowing in advance or knowing before something is an issue is how lives get saved. And I, I think all the time about how differently it could have gone for me. I feel the lab saved my life. 
I'm Dr. Blair Holliday, the CEO of ASCP, and welcome to the first webinar of 2022. Today, we are honoring Cervical Health Awareness Month by discussing cervical cancer screening for our patients in 2022. And as you saw in our opening Patient Champions video, which features the story of Danielle, who learned that she had an irregular pap test at the age of 24. The importance of screening younger patients is highlighted and the value of cytology is clear. Now, before we get started, I wanna take an opportunity to celebrate the fact that 22 actually marks a very important uh, milestone in the history of ASCP. It's the 100th anniversary of the founding of the American Society for Clinical Pathology. We have activities planned throughout the year to recognize this momentous achievement. We're gonna be celebrating our members throughout a year long series of activities and events that will culminate in the annual meeting in Chicago, September 9th, or sorry, September 7th through the 9th. ASCP members can attend this meeting for free this year as a member benefit. Please join us on September 7th through the 9th of 2022 in Chicago. Cervical Cancer Health Awareness Month is an opportunity to provide education to the public, to the patients, to our caregivers, pathologists, cytologists, patient advocacy groups, and other clinicians and educating these communities about the critical role the laboratory and OBGYNs play in cervical health and helping patients understand their diagnoses and increasing the collaboration and trust between the patients and their healthcare providers is critical. Cervical cancer screening and the management guidelines have recently evolved as medical specialty societies and patient advocacy organizations and the United States Preventative Services Task Force or the ESTSPF search for guidance to optimize patient care and access to care is always a hot topic in our country. And it's now more important than ever to keep the focus on providing our patients with access to the best appropriate care. Currently, the United States does not have a universal healthcare screening and organizing screening program. And this does lead to significant disparities in care. So access to care for underserved populations is essential. We're gonna be discussing that today. Today, we're also gonna be highlighting patient-centric equitable care, the focus on the role of co-testing, the roles that will play in 22 in the foreseeable future. Now, the standard of care in the United States in co-testing is due to its increased sensitivity over either cytology or HPV alone. However, both tests contribute to the overall diagnosis for the patient. And similarly, we will look at primary HPV performance, screening intervals, vaccine availability, as well as other elements to consider that are salient points in this domain around patient care. Today, we have a multidisciplinary team of experts with us. These individuals will be focusing on patient-centric opportunities to discuss how we can look at just the cases you'll be seeing, but also comparing them to the literature and the current topics and concern in our community. We have two expert pathologists and two expert OBGYNs. Now, let me give you a short introduction of our panelists. Dr. Darren Wheeler has been working with Quest Diagnostics for over 15 years, providing general surgical pathology and women's health pathology expertise as part of a group of 20 pathologists covering both community and hospital-based pathology in Las Vegas, Nevada. Dr. Wheeler is involved with projects in digital pathology and artificial intelligence, and he focuses on future potential to improve efficacies and forward our current screening and diagnostic test offerings to the public. Dr. Adrian Stevenson is a board certified OBGYN practicing in the DC metropolitan area. She received her medical degree from Howard University of College of Medicine and completed her residency at Emory University in 2016. And her professional passions include educating women about their sexual and reproductive health and equal access to health care. She also loves baking, traveling, and spending quality time with a spoiled Frenchie Rocky. And Dr. Diane Davey is a professor of pathology and associate dean of graduate medical education at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine in Orlando. And she's also a pathologist at the Orlando VAMC. She's been an advisor for both the FDA, for the National Cancer Institute, 
She serves on editorial boards for three different journals and has over 100 peer-reviewed publications. And lastly, Dr. Amita Grisk Murphy is the clinical lead for NYC DOCMH Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network. And it's a program dedicated to decreasing the scourge of maternal morbidity and mortality in New York City. Dr. Murphy is a board certified OBGYN whose clinical life has been spent in practicing sensitive and respectful care and family planning. And she has published many articles in peer reviewed journals as well as in chapters, and textbooks. Thank you all for joining us today. We're looking forward to the conversation. Today, we're going to be focusing on a day in the life of our clinicians as they take care of our patients. We're going to review patient cases, and we're going to allow time for a live Q&A at the end of the session so each of the audience participants can get involved. So please remember, when we get to the end of this particular webinar, you'll have an opportunity to enter your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll address as many of those as possible at the end. And for those we don't address, we will post those live on the website at ASCP. First up is Dr. Wheeler, who is going to discuss a case study and highlight his role and contributions as a pathologist. Dr. Wheeler, please present the first case. Thank you. Uh, this was a patient uh, that was you know, fairly straightforward diagnostically, but I think really will bring up an interesting discussion. Uh, she's a 21-year-old female. Uh, she had no prior pap history in our database, so this was likely her first uh, screen at, eight, at the age of 21, um, appropriate to guidelines. And uh, we're looking at the, the pap smear here um, in one of the groups of atypical cells um, that's kind of more central uh, with a high nucleocytoplasmic ratio, uh, hyperchromatic nuclei, you know, uh, this is a kind of a diagnostic cell group that is a, a high-grade lesion. So that was her diagnosis on PAP. And uh, this is some images from her colposcopic biopsy. It was a, a generous biopsy, yet what you see here um, is the uh, surface epithelium showing full thickness atypia um, that actually extends um, from margin to margin on this biopsy. So, uh, you know, based on biopsy, a fairly extensive high-grade lesion. Um, in the inset, uh, the image shows cells which um, show no significant maturation on up into the surface where there's maybe some slight flattening of the cells, uh, but for the most part, no maturation whatsoever. Several mitotic figures. We normally don't like to see uh, these squamous cells dividing um, at the mid or upper levels of the epithelium. And so it has all the high mar hallmarks of a high-grade lesion. And if we wanted to kind of subclassify that high-grade lesion, this would be a, a CIN3 uh, lesion. So, you know, I wanted to share this case because it's timely in that uh, with the 2020 American Cancer Society guidelines uh, that, you know, recently came out, there is a preferred uh, measure that we move the starting age of screening to age 25. And obviously we're looking here at a, a young woman. I think this case highlights the importance of cytology in women under uh, uh, you know, age 25. Uh, and uh, I think we, we've seen that uh, in the, the story of Danielle that we just uh, seen that video. Um, and so you know, I push it back to you, Dr. Holliday, for discussion around this case. Thanks, and, and I appreciate you bringing this up as the first case, because it does, in fact, as you indicated, uh, go back and, and reiterate the story of Danielle, which was in the, original, um, in the original video that opened up this particular webinar. There's a very high rate of HPV positivity as well in the recent impact trial. trial. I think 24% of women 20 to 29 years of age are HPV positive. So Women under the age of 30, and in particular under the age of 25, are also affected by this condition, and we're concerned about that. HPV vaccination rates are also lower, as you know, in our country compared to other countries. So I'd like to ask the OBGYNs um, a couple of questions about your perspective on um, patients who would fall outside the guidelines. So let's just start with um, the first question, which is, do you have any concerns at all about starting screening at the age of 25? 
Sure. Um, I certainly do. Um, like you mentioned, the HPV vaccination rates are already uh, below target levels. And then in addition to that, our screening rates are lower in this age group. Um, so raising that screening uh, start age to 25 could definitely or will definitely increase the already high rate of under screening in this uh, population from 25 to 29 and then further exacerbate like health uh, inequalities and cervical cancer screening um, as well as incidence. Dr. Marty, what's your thoughts? I would agree with Dr. Stevenson's um, statements. Uh, you know, the, the age of Koitarki in the United States um, is younger. So increasing the screening age to 25 means that we're missing not just the opportunity for screening for cervical cancer, but also for screening for other um, sexually transmitted infections as well. There's other opportunities for education, um, either around contraception as well as barrier protection that might help with preventing further HPV infection. So I would agree that increasing that screening age is would not um, serve well this younger age group. So do either of you have any concerns about uh, beginning primary HPV screening at the age of 25, or what is your perspective on the parallel between these two types of uh, opportunities as it relates to the guidelines that are being promulgated? Dr. Stevenson, um, thoughts about that? So I think that um, the primary HPV screening is challenging in this population just because like you mentioned, the rates of HPV in this population are higher um, or are high in general. Um, and we also see that these infections are generally transient. So going down this pathway of um, you know, workups and colposcopies and unindicated procedures, I think that increases um, as well as anxiety for you know, results that may and probably not result in disease. Any other comments on that, Dr. Murphy? Okay. All right. So, uh, Dr. Wheeler, let's move over to case number two, if we could. Sure. So, um, this uh, was a, a case of a 37-year-old woman. Um, she actually had uh, a history, a PAP history in our database um, at age 26, where she did uh, receive a PAP um, that was an ASCUS result and it was reflexed to HPV and was negative. Um, but then there was a gap, at least in our database, from age 26 to now 37, um, where she did receive a co-test of PAP and HPV together. So I'm not sure whether uh, it was a true gap in care or she had uh, changed providers during that interim period. But um, at this time, uh, her co-test was uh, uh, included a, a, a thin prep PAP, and we're looking at the PAP here. Um, which was a difficult PAP. There was um, kind of at, at the left of the, of the image here, you're seeing this kind of uh, very kind of pink red cytoplasm. It's, it's, a, it's a superficial kind of keratinized looking cell, um, highly atypical cells. So the concern was for kind of a keratinizing dysplasia going on. And when we see that form of dysplasia, um, it's concerning for a, a very advanced lesion. Um, and uh, not the typical kind of standard high-grade PAP that we saw in that, that first case. Um, in addition, the background, we refer to the term dirty. It kind of had a dirty background just to the right of those cells as a cluster of neutrophils, some inflammation, um, some uh, kind of just kind of background cellular material that's kind of free-floating. And so though that combination of findings really makes us concerned for an advanced lesion, whether it was still a high grade lesion or perhaps even in an in invasive cancer. So we think about those things, but this was only one of two atypical groups of cells on the slide. There was no background cells of a typical high grade lesion. Um, at the right hand of the slide, you actually see some just superficial squamous cells that are absolutely normal um, in comparison to the, to the abnormal cells at the left. So um, this was actually shared with a couple of pathologists to see where they would lean towards. And everyone felt the need that this, this patient really needed uh, follow-up management. And so um, uh, the, the diagnosis of ASK-H or atypical squamous cells um, cannot rule out a high-grade lesion uh, was, was the diagnosis. Um, and I will say that in that co-test, she did get an HPV test, um, and that HPV test was negative. 
so this was actually her follow-up colposcopic biopsy. Um, and what you're looking at in the left-hand part of the slide um, is a fairly extensive kind of um, standard high-grade lesion. Um, and as you get down towards the base of that, that superficial mucosa, you actually see the interface between the epithelium and inline stromus is starting to get obscure. There's, there's a brisk inflammatory reaction to this lesion, um, and it starts to get concerning that there may be invasion. And um, sure enough, as you kind of go along the lesion, what I've highlighted in the box um, in the inset, which next slide I'll, I'll magnify, is actually these little nests in the center of the screen, which actually show that same keratinization that we saw in the PAP test. Um, and what you're looking at is, it's kind of a dismaturation process going on in the space epithelium that occurs when the cells become invasive into the stroma. So these are, you know, three or four isolated nests below um, the surface mucosa that are actually now, or surface epithelium that's now invading the stroma. So this is now a microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma. And so, you know, I, I wanted to share this case for a number of reasons. I mean, one, I think, you know, here is an example that as statistics of the U.S. of a of a woman with invasive squamous cell carcinoma in our screening population. Um, I think these are the types of patients um, are, are, that are, you know, the things that we want to avoid in, in every practice. It's, you know, this woman that's doing everything she's told to do according to the guidelines as uh, informed by her provider. Uh, and yet we don't just miss a high-grade lesion. She actually develops an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And when I see cases like this, I always look back um, at that individual practice and look at the kind of care the woman was getting to decide, you know, is this the woman that hasn't had a pap in 10 years and just walked in the door with this advanced lesion, or is this someone in our screening population? And, and if it was in our screening population, you know, what could have been done differently, if anything, that could have avoided this? I, I think the fortunate thing here is we're looking at a very small focus of invasion. So I think this is a very treatable cancer at this point. But, uh, you know, for one, I, I can't help but think if this woman was in a primary screening program and only received an HPV test as her primary screen, you can imagine that this woman would have screened negative and she would have been told that she could come back in a five-year interval. And I think that would have made a very different disease to be treating. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Holliday, for further discussion. So the uh, case describes... Um a PAP positive HPV negative squamous cell carcinoma. And as we know, there are well-established HPV negative cancers. Uh, there's been examples in the literature, uh, including from Quest, the BLAT study, which showed that 18.6% of cancers were HPV negative and 5.5% were um, negative with co-testing as well. The Kaufman study also at a Quest showed 22.5% of those cancers were HPV negative with 5.9% co-testing. Uh, Austin's data out of uh, UPMC, within one year uh, of a diagnosis of cancer, 15.6% of the cancers, HPV negative. And so the, the data is out there, also data from Columbia University. It's not just cancers or HPV negative, but also CN2 plus negative. So high-grade lesions that could be also negative or um, a moderate to severe dysplasia. The study out of Houston Methodist, the ZAL study showed that 8.7% of those CN2s were negative uh, and 1.2 with co-testing. The Soraya study um, with the CDC, which was using under and underinsured women, showed a little over 10% of the HCL cases were also HPV negative. So the question I have for the panelists is this, and I'd like to start with Dr. Davey. Um, have you seen similar patient cases in your practice? Yes, I've certainly seen some cases. And just to highlight an example, um, one of the areas I've been involved with with cytology is adequacy guidelines. And um, we've seen some patients who came in, and usually we don't do HPV testing if the cytology looks unsatisfactory. It's very scantily cellular. But we've had a few cases where the clinician was very insistent. And we've had patients come in HPV negative originally, and then they came in for repeat PAP, and they had a significant abnormality. I don't know if I recall a cancer recently at the VA, but we certainly have seen um, some sig significant abnormalities. And so I think if the sample is not really good, I think some people have the idea that the HPV test is perfect, and it's 
subject to some of the same issues that we have with other testing. Um, I'd also point out, it seems like some of the data, I, I point out a lot of the same studies as you. And in some of the older women, and maybe, you know, who haven't been screened regularly, I worry about um, HPV negative um, results. They could be squamous cancers, adenocarcinoma is even a little bit more common overall, and as well as, as even some other types of cancers. And so if you don't have a really good screening history, um, they, they may not be getting, um, I think they really need to get cytology. And if there's not a good screening history, I would be very concerned about that five-year gap. Um, I think some people just look at that and they don't look at the previous history as well. So I think we have a significantly higher likelihood of finding all significant lesions with um, regular screening. And if it's not been regular, I would be very concerned about five years. And also um, forgetting about older women, many of whom have not been screened. They may go to the doctor for other reasons and they're not getting cervical cytology screening. And let's ask our gynecologist, uh, Dr. Stevenson or Murphy, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, have you seen similar case, cases in your practice? So I haven't had um, uh, necessarily diagnosed HPV negative cancers, but like Dr. Davies said, I have seen a lot of patients that have had like abnormal cytology with uh, normal or negative HPV. And then following the guidelines, they'll come back, we'll do another, uh, you know, cytology and HPV and the same thing, which takes them to a culpo and then they do end up having a high grade lesion. So I have seen quite a few of those cases, um, not a cancer, but Clearly, that's, you know, it's possible for sure. Um, in my clinical experience within uh, New York City has been with mostly under and uninsured women, um, particularly those who are um, fairly recent immigrants to New York City and so may not have had routine cervical, cervical screening in their home countries. And so, sadly, we have seen not as many cancers with HPV negative, definitely cervical dysplasia with that discrepancy between HPV positivity and level of disease. But yes, in, in the past, in my history of taking care of women, I have seen HPV negative cancers. So Dr. Stevenson, you brought up colposcopy, which is, which is an interesting point. Is it common mm -hmm. uh, for you to perform colposcopy in a setting of negative cervical cancer screening for patients who have symptoms? Uh, and are you, if, if you were to do a culpo in that setting, what would prompt you to do it? Um, not for a negative screening, but I would do, the times where I've done like a biopsy or a culpo would be if they present and there's like an abnormal appearing lesion. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't noticed any particular symptoms that, you know, with a negative screening would draw me, it would uh, push me to do a culpo. But what I would say is, um, I would just, yeah, just symptoms, really. I mean, excuse me, not symptoms, um, uh, a, a gross lesion that I would see on exam. Right. What about you, Dr. Martin? I mean, I think the, with a, in the case of a negative screening, again, I would not go straight to colposcopy. The main symptom driver that I think would have me skip a, a quote unquote screen would be maybe postquital bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, classic teaching has always been that postcoital bleeding is that main symptom that's of concern for um, a cervical lesion of some sort. Um, I think also, again, it's also very dependent on um, gross appearance on physical exam. And so if there's something of concern on physical exam, that would also drive me to um, colposcopy. Okay, okay. Um, let's move over to uh since we're in the discussion around symptoms and what to do uh, from a clinical perspective versus strictly cytology um, or histopathology and following up with HPV testing, let's talk about interval and compliance for a minute and the potential for mist disease. So mist disease is especially important given that the current screening interval for the test is five years, as you guys have been describing. And PAP test screening or PAP screening for cervical cancer has led to significant decline in the incidence of the disease. We all know that over the past 80 years. And in recent years, of course, 
as we're describing today, new technologies like liquid-based cytology and HPV co-testing has really allowed for interval expansion, right? This, that expansion, that number has gone from annually to now we're referring to as a five-year interval. Unlike many other countries, however, where HPV primary screening has been implemented, the United States does not have an organized screening program. And the recent data shows that our screening compliance is actually declining based on their database that the review is up to 35% may be considered under screen. And that's a significant number of people. Um, and that's actually coming from insurance data and surveys, they're showing similar trends as well. So overall, cervical cancer instance rates really no longer decline as it had been. And cervical cancer is increasing, maybe, maybe even potentially women over the age of 50, certainly in the past decade. So let's talk about screening interval. And I, I, I'm very interested in your, your opinion on this interval. What are your thoughts on the interval? And do your patients understand the interval? Do they understand cervical screening um, when it happens uh, in a five-year process? Are they compliant? You know, are there any patients that are, were going to be particularly, um, unfortunately, missed, maybe based on their race, their ethnicity, or socio-demographic demographic factors? What, what are your thoughts? We'll start with the gynecologist first on the interval? You know, I think much of my career has been spent focusing on that annual exam and encouraging the annual screening, not just for PAP, but for other chronic disease and um, using that annual exam for other opportunities of education and counseling. You know, I, when the interval changed, it was actually a very funny conversation because now the patients were asking, well, why am I not coming in every year? I was coming in every year. Now you're asking me not to come in every year. I had a small subset of patients who were really um, upset about that expanded screening. Um, on the other hand, I would say that, you know, again, in this underinsured, uninsured population who already have a number of barriers to accessing care, increasing anything that increases the time for touch points is going to decrease that access and just make another um, barrier for them to leap over. And so, you know, it would be terrible to miss disease, but, you know, I have patients who already have so many challenges coming to the office Increasing that screening interval just means it's another it's another missed opportunity for them. Dr. Stevenson, um, I was just going to comment on you had asked a question about do patients understand and compliance. Um, I agree with everything Dr. Murphy said, but I also think it's important to make sure I always make sure to explain to patients like what the PAP is, what we're screening for, how often we screen like when that changes, what prompts changes. And I think like creating like a all hands on deck type of approach with, you know, me emphasizing it, patients understanding it, I think it helps, but, you know, certainly access to care is a huge issue. And then disparities in terms of education and understanding what like HPV and PAPs are still, still remain. So let, let's talk about disparities for a minute, shall we? Let's, mm -hmm. Have you seen differences in compliance in patients based on race or ethnicity or social demographic factors? Because we all know that there are disparities to access cervical right. cancer screen in the US. Have you seen any, you know, any compliance issues as based on patients? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, Black and Latinx women, um, they do have generally or sometimes more uh, barriers to care, right. um, difference in knowledge um, about the HPV and cervical cancer, um, and then also vaccination rates as well. So I think those all um, have the potential to impact the access that they have. So a little bit, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. I mean, I would also say that there are, even within major urban areas, there are difficulties with accessing care in those areas that are either not well-serviced by public transportation or other means of transportation. So, you know, I have taken care of women in a urban versus suburban versus rural, I wouldn't call it true rural, but really, really deep into suburbia. And there's a lot of issues with access to care and, and obtaining um, appropriate screening in that setting as well. Right. So We've been Sarah, could I, oh, could I comment? Please, please go ahead. Yes, please. 
Yeah, you know, at the VA, and even though they have access, we're seeing a lot of delays. And I would say the COVID pandemic, and the CDC has been finding that. I, I mean, it recovers for a while, and then it, it goes back. A lot of a lot of places are not, um, certainly our VA is one of the busiest in the country for COVID. And we stopped doing routine care a lot of times. That's been happening in a lot of settings. And we're seeing a lot of people with either no history of screening or abnormal previous history who are not coming back. And I think the CDC says that that's more common in minorities. We already, already know that invasive cancers um, the mortality is a bit higher in some of these groups of women. Right. So some of the data has shown that uh, Black and Hispanic women are much less likely to have had a co-test the last five years. And there's a 14, maybe even higher percent in, in Black women can, and 22% higher in Hispanic women. So culturally appropriate education, I think, is an important conversation we need to have here. Um, but the, certainly the access to testing, as, you, as you've been describing, has been exacerbated as, as it has been during COVID as well on all diseases, but in particular for, for a disease such as this that um, really has no reason to ever, ever, ever happen. So um, I'm, we're concerned about that and we need to make sure that we do the best we can in helping our, our patients understand uh, what the access to testing opportunities are, as well as getting access to the right appropriate information. I want to move over to the guidelines for, for a few minutes and talk a little bit about that because I'm, um, we're all aware that the, um, there are guidelines that have been developed and let's just talk a little bit about that right now. Right now, the American Cancer Society guidelines are the outlier, but ACOG and ASCCP and for Society for Gynecological Oncology, they've all aligned around the 2018 USCSPS guidelines and providing choice for individual clinicians and pathologists to provide their opinions during the open comment period, but providing choice. That is, it's up to you, the gynecologist, the pathologist to decide what's best for your patient. And I think the open comment period that's, that's occurring right now with the USTSPF um, should hopefully um, jumpstart some conversations with our panel as well as with our, with our member audience here in a few minutes. But for the OBGYNs on the panel, what guidelines drive your decision-making? A guideline or all guidelines? What guidelines do? Um, I with, gener yeah, go ahead, Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> um, I follow uh, ASCCP and ACOG. Um, and I, yeah, those are the ones that align most with what I think um, is appropriate in terms of screening. And what about you, Dr. Marty? Um, I would say that, you know, I work within a health system. And so um, the health system as a whole has decided what guidelines that they would follow based on patient volume and um, the patient demographics that we see. Um, it turns out that it is um, a combination of ACOG and ASCCP guidelines, but you know, like our, our enterprise has worked with our local um, pathologists and OBGYNs to come up with um, which guidelines that we agree with. And so it does happen to be ACOG and ACCP. But I would say that, you know, again, in New York City, we have different health systems and each one decides how they're going to operate on and which guidelines they're going to be using. So for example, our system, New York City's health and hospital system might be very different than Mount Sinai, which might be very different than Northwell, which might be very different than um, New York Presbyterian, for example. Uh, Dr. Davey or Dr. Wheeler, any comments? Sure, I'd like to comment. You know, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, um, a number of organizations, and I personally put in comments. Some of the concerns that we have, a lot of the data you mentioned earlier, Dr. Holliday, were from real world studies, like in our laboratories, places like Columbia, Pittsburgh, and so forth. Um, a lot of the organizations have really been relying on modeling data, European data, data in organized screening systems like Kaiser, and those may not represent our actual laboratories. So we hope that the US Preventive Service Task Force really looks at our real world data, which I think is extremely important. The US Preventive Service Task Force, as you remember, 
initially on their draft guidelines a few years ago was not going to um, have co-testing as an option. But a lot of organizations, including ASCP, American Society of Cytopathology, CAP, wrote in comments, and we got co-testing to add it back in. We don't know what's going to happen this time. Okay. And I would totally agree with that. Uh, you know, um, I think that um, when we look at the modeling data, um, you know, the majority of it, you know, heavily weighted on the Kaiser data in the ACCP management guidelines, um, you know, a paper I would point out, um, you know, the CDC looked at a database for kind of under and uninsured women. Um, and looked at the risk of, of CIN3 or greater um, in those women. And when they looked at the risk in, in that population of women in the CDC database, I think Dr. Soraya was the, the lead author, they found that the risk for those women was greater than what was in the, uh, the modeling you know, management uh, result that you get uh, from, from today's management guidelines. And I think that reflects the fact that I think one thing we have to do is start looking at data sets that are a little more diverse in population. Um, and, you know, uh, speaking from somebody in a community-based practice, um, you know, compliance and access to care is so much more a factor than in a closed Kaiser system. And so I think we have to think about that. And, you know, I was disappointed when um, the ACS came out with their guidelines in 2020 and, you know, intervals weren't looked at because I think that is a factor um, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, since we expanded intervals back in 2012 and, and preferred a five-year interval, we've seen a 2 to 3% year-over-year increase in cervical cancer incidents in the U.S. And, you know, I think we always think of the success that we've had with the PAP test since the 1940s, decreasing cervical cancer mortality, which is absolutely true in the U.S. But I think we really need to hone in on the fact that since 2012, we've allowed for a little more cancer risk in women um into our guidelines and instead of looking at um you know intervals where we've allowed that risk and it's 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 turned out into an increased cervical cancer instance in the u.s i think um we're now looking at alternative strategies like primary to add even more risk and i think right now we're all and i agree with the acog's latest practice advisory we really should be more focused on access to scare access to care screening utilization um, and having HPV vaccination talks with our patients because ultimately HPV vaccination is what is going to allow us to relax our guidelines a bit. Um, but for right now, I think we need to be diligent and, and watch um, how cervical cancer instances is changing right now in the U.S. So Dr. Stevenson and Murphy, I, we've been saying it over and over that HPV primary in the U.S. is the uptake has been relatively low. And despite it being approved in the guidelines for several years, why do you think the majority of clinicians have not switched over to HPV primary or co-testing? I personally trained um, and, and actually did a lot of my um, clinical practice in the time before um, HPV primary and co-testing. And so I, I think of it as an added bonus and I would feel completely uncomfortable um, without cytology. I think cytology gives us a lot of information and I don't think I would ever move to a non-cytology or co-testing based screening practice myself. Dr. Steven, so why do you think it's not, why, why have many, many clinicians not switched over to primary? I think um, the lack of comfort, I think, for, at least for me, stems from the rates of HPV negative cancers or HPV, HPV negative dysplasia. Um, and it's like Dr. Murphy said, you're, you're really missing valuable information without the cytology, um, like we saw in the first case. So I think that's really where it stems from. Um, I don't think that we are, at least here in the States, in terms of our vaccination rates and our compliance rates, we're really in the position to really just rely on HPV um, as a primary screen. Okay. Well, and let's would, move on. Go ahead. I I'm sorry. If I can, one, just one comment. I would say, just from the lab side of it, um, you know, whenever some new strategy or new test comes along, I always ask, you know, what is the benefit to the patient? And right now, um, you know, when people talk about HPV primary, I think some patients think, oh, my, my PAP is going away. Um, and actually, that's not really the case, right? So 
the, the woman only takes on some increased risk from having a less sensitive screen. And she doesn't get any other benefit because she still has to collect a pap test for that HPV test because we, you know, in many cases, we'll have to do a reflex pap test off of a positive HPV result in a primary screen in order to triage that, that screen. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what's really happening is, is you're collecting that pap information, but when the HPV screen is negative, the lab is tossing that valuable information into the trash. And I think that's where I think the, the dialogue is, is around, you know, what does the PAP contribute to diagnosis? And in the studies, you know, Dr. Holliday, you mentioned earlier on, there are many examples where it shows the strong contribution of the PAP. Um, when I think about, um, you know, our, our Quest data that Dr. Kaufman published um, in, that, in that, that review, the, uh, the false negative rate on uh, co-testing women 30 and above was 0.3%. Um, and you're just not going to get a better overall screen than that. And, um, you know, it reduces by over half the false negative rate with HPV alone. So definitely the PAP is contributing, and especially in advanced lesion and cancers, as we talked about, it is con definitely contributing by reducing that risk of missing uh, invasive cancer by over half. So I think, you know, um, that to me uh, tells me that there's really no value proposition for women and getting rid of, of their PAP test, which is already being collected in a primary screen strategy. Okay. Now, I just add one more thing to that, mm -hmm. and I, I really don't have much to add, but I want to just point out that a lot of laboratories are using testing platforms, HPV testing platforms that are wonderful. They have a lot of benefits, but now that they're not approved for a primary screening indication. So they're happy with those platforms. They have the instruments there. Um, so they're probably not encouraging the clinicians to change and the clinicians are very happy with um, the HPV testing platform that they're getting. So it is, there's a lot of, um, a lot involved from the laboratory side in switching that. Okay, good. Well, why don't we take a look, couple look at a few more cases, Dr. Wheeler. Let's start with uh, the next case and uh, describe this for us. So uh, this is a 32-year-old uh, woman um, and in our database, she had a, an unremarkable PAP history uh, in the age range of 21 to 29, multiple PAPs, all negative. Um, but at the age of 32, she received um, a co-test. And again, her PAP test was negative, but her HPV test was uh, uh, positive. So um, in this circumstance, the provider elected to have the patient return in a year, repeated the tests and got the same result. So she actually ended up going to colposcopy for a persistent high-risk HPV infection. Um, and when she, you know, and this is in my discussion with the provider, when, when she went to colposcopy, um, the colposcopic impression was negative, um, no biopsies were done, and uh, an, an, an endocertical curatage was performed. And what we're looking at here um, is some real scant fragments that are highly magnified from the endocircal curatage. And this is the roof kind of of the squamous epithelium that's showing a high grade lesion. And in the inset, um, the brown stain there is, a, is P16. P16 is a protein that is overexpressed in uh, cervical cells that have been transformed by a high risk HPV infection. And we use the staining and the staining pattern to help us be very specific about um, if there's a high grade lesion present or not. Um, as well as identifying of cervical origin. So, um, you know, very scanty, small fragments, you know, probably something arising higher in the canal that just wasn't seen on colposcopy. Um, and then uh, she ends up going to a leap. And you can see here, I don't think you have to be a pathologist to see all the blue, but what we're looking at is a fairly extensive high-grade lesion. It's crawling down into under, underlying endocervical glands and up at the upper right at the surface, you can see it continues along the surface uh, along that leap. And this was actually going down to, to the margins of this leap. So I think this highlights, you know, you might just see the tip of the iceberg on some of these samples where the cytology or the tissue may be very scanty. And yet when you actually get the lesion out, it's fairly sizable. And, you know, I wanted to share this case, one, because this is certainly not something that it, it was a, a case that was difficult to find. Um, this happens quite frequently um, where, um, you know, it's the benefit of two tests over one that really end up 
of bringing the patient to um, diagnosis and, and, under, and management. Um, and I think just natural history wise, you think about this woman um, who's had a long negative pap history. Um, you know, this woman is maybe, you know, several years, uh, maybe getting into that, you know, worrisome time frame of five plus years into having this lesion. So this is a woman that becomes really at risk, um, I think, to develop an invasive cancer. And so, you know, thank goodness um, that um, having that HPV test along with the PAP, um, you know, allowed this uh, patient to be diagnosed um, with the high-grade lesion. And I think emphasizes, you know, the other alternative strategy we have, right, is to just PAP these patients every three years. Um, and, you know, uh, we talked about the contribution of the PAP, which is very strong especially now with, you know, not only liquid-based cytology, but imaging technology on the back end in many of our laboratories. But that being said, um, you know, uh, it, it still, you know, lacks the sensitivity to stand on its own. And I think um, these patients really benefit from having the co-testing. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Holliday. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'd like to go ahead and move to the next case. Okay. Um, which is the glandular disease case. So let's uh, sure. move over and take a look at that. Sure. So um, this is a very interesting patient. So she uh, was a woman who was in a, uh, was being followed by a provider who did not do co-testing. Um, so we actually had a, a long number, I want to say it was six negative PAPs um, in the system from the prior provider. But then the patient switched providers at age uh, 44. Um, and with her new provider, uh, they were doing co-testing. So she got her first co-test um, at age 44, and right off the bat, um, she had a uh, uh, negative PAP, but she was positive for uh, HPV, um, and that went on to genotyping, and the genotyping, um, it was the Aptima mRNA-based HPV test, so their genotyping includes 45 that's pooled with type 18 as well, so in 18, uh, 45 came back as detected. So um, because of that, she went to a colposcopy, um, and at the time of colposcopy, again, you know, per the provider, did not really see any uh, lesion. I can tell you that she did do a biopsy, uh, one biopsy, and it was just kind of some nonspecific inflammatory changes, um, but did also do an endocervical curatage. Uh, and you can see here, uh, what I'm showing you now, because they were so scanty, was really scant fragments of uh, glandular epithelium that is staining strongly for P16. Um, these atypical fragments with the staining allowed me to be kind of diagnostic and tell the provider this is at least adenocarcinoma in situ, um, but it's very scanty. And I can tell you when I had the conversation, um, the provider, you know, was, was, uh, had a hard time believing me, you know, saying, well, you know, it's a very long negative path history. It is a new patient for me, but I really didn't see anything. Do you realize this means I'm going to have to do a high endocervical cone? Are you absolutely certain? And I said, I am certain that it's going to at least be adenocarcinoma in situ. And uh, when I had the next conversation with the provider after getting, uh, uh, well, it actually was, it was uh, the, uh, this, this cone biopsy, uh, it, it was quite shocking. Um, this is an extensive uh, adenocarcinoma that is invasive. Um, and uh, I didn't really need the P16 stain, but I did the stain to kind of highlight, you know, the, the large uh, lesion here at right. And then on the inset, you see the actual H&E uh, slide of it. But um, this, this unfortunate woman really had a very deeply invasive adenocarcinoma um, and uh, ultimately uh, in her hysterectomy uh, had, uh, had positive nodes. And the most recent specimen I've seen for this patient, she did have a pelvic recurrence already. Um, and so, um, you know, really, I, again, a quite shocking patient uh, where, you know, colposcopy was essentially negative. Um, and again, um, you know, having the co-testing really allowed for the identification uh, of this patient. Um, and so uh, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Holliday, for further discussion. And I think uh, because this illustrates obviously a particular missed disease, uh, endocervical adenocarcinomas, of course, are the ones we, the, the incidence is increasing now and it accounts for more than 25% of cervical cancers diagnosed in the U.S. Um, so obviously your case illustrates that this could be a compelling reason why code testing might be an important factor here, particularly since approximately 15% of these lesions are not associated with HPV. So 
Again, there's been great work you mentioned, Dr. Kaufman and Mirshan, Dr. Austin as well has done some work on looking at detecting, uh, uh, using code testing to detect HPV, I'm sorry, detect adenocarcinoma in the vein of cervix. And it's two times more likely to occur if you use a code test. All right, well, there is actually one more really interesting case on the glandular side that I'd like for you to illustrate for us, Dr. Wheeler. So let's go to, let's go to case number five since it's concurrent with our uh, previous conversation. Sure. So this is a 58-year-old woman, um, and her provider was co-testing her every three years, and she had a negative kind of co-test history. Um, and in her most recent uh, co-test, uh, uh, so just three years later after a negative co-test, um, her pap showed atypical glandular cells favor neoplasia, um, and, but her HPV test was negative. And obviously, given her age, you know, obviously, Although um, knowing that HPV, you know, negative lesions of the cervix can happen, um, there was some cervical sampling, but obviously we also worry about the endometrium um, given the, the age and, and this lesion being uh, HPV negative. So indeed, the endocervical curatage that was done was negative, so I won't share that with you, but this is from her endometrial biopsy, and what it showed is just fragments of what turned out to be a uterine serous carcinoma of the, of the endometrium. Um, and I wanted to share this case because I, I think as we talk about cervical cancer screening and, you know, we have commentary on all the different cervical cancer screening strategies and the contribution of the PAP, you know, I want, I thought this case highlighted that, you know, indeed there are other contributions the PAP makes um, outside of cervical cancer. Um, and indeed, here's a woman who was completely asymptomatic coming in for her routine screening, um, and yet... Um, ended up having an endometrial cancer diagnosed solely because of the pap test. And, and again, this is another one that I would think, you know, uh, you know, if the woman was in a primary screening strategy, uh, she would screen negative for HPV, obviously, uh, as the endometrial cancers are not driven by HPV, and she would be told to come back in five years. She obviously would have probably come back much sooner, uh, symptomatic, uh, perhaps with more bulky disease. Um, and, you know, I've heard uh, commentary in the past saying, well, when we diagnose endometrial cancer on a uh, pap test, um, that it doesn't really change the overall survival. But, you know, I would just say that anytime that we can diagnose a cancer earlier, no matter what cancer, anytime we can diagnose a cancer when it is asymptomatic and much more amenable to uh, treatment and maybe more conservative treatment, um, I think uh, the patient is way better off. So I, when I see this and this is not infrequent. Uterine serous carcinoma is relatively rare, um, but um, many times a year I will diagnose an endometrial cancer, uh, usually of the endometrioid type, um, the, in a patient who was otherwise completely asymptomatic in routine screening solely based on a, on a pap test. And I think um, that, you know, I think is a benefit and another benefit of the PAP, of which there are many other things that the PAP contributes to. So I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Holliday. Yeah, so Dr. Wheeler's point is good. I'd like the, the gynecologist to weigh in on this because what he's really referencing is the additional benefits that the PAP can provide past just what it's being intended for, such as your adequacy of specimens is what Dr. Davey was talking about, the importance of specimen adequacy. Other cancers can metastasize, you know, ovarian, bladder, colon, breast, lung, they can metastasize <clears throat> infectious organisms, hormonal status, et cetera. But for, for the gynecologists uh, on our panel here, what other patient healthcare and wellness opportunities do you find during PAP test screening? Dr. Wheeler, would you like to start? I'm just Dr. Stevenson, either one. Sure. Um, I think uh, the PAP test and like that visit is extremely important. Um, just to highlight other um, wellness checks. So like your STI screenings, um, making sure other screenings are up to date. It's an opportunity to screen for intimate partner violence. Um, I think it's also helps to strengthen the relationship between the patient and the clinician, um, which I think does contribute um, or helps in terms of um, maintaining appropriate compliance. Dr. Murphy? Um, I think we have other opportunities here as well. You know, I think um, in certain areas where there may not be, or there are disadvantaged share hospitals, there's a lot of funding attached to screening for alcoholism, tobacco use, um, again, also intimate partner violence. I think there's chronic disease screening. 
you know, we not only have increasing rates of uh, cervical cancer, but we have increasing rates of obesity and its associated um, secondary diseases like diabetes and hypertension. Um, so there's opportunities for education there. There's, um, you know, simple, other simple opportunities like dental checks, like reminders for dental checks, reminders for eye, eye vision checks, um, and all sorts of education and counseling opportunities that can come up at these visits that contributes not just to cervical cancer health, but overall health in general. Including the world we live in with COVID, right? Helping people understand the significance of being tested and quarantining for the disease, in particular, maybe even being treated today. Thank you all again for your time today. This has been an incredibly illuminating panel. I can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise with us. Um, before we close, I'm going to remind folks that we are going to take questions and we're going to be answering those questions for you. We'll do our best to get to the majority of the questions as we can as time provides. Um, but again, I would like to thank our distinguished panelists for such a lively discussion. It was highly relevant. I hope everybody enjoyed today's webinar. I want you to stay involved. Remember, staying involved means mainly being involved in your medical specialty societies as a practitioner, being involved in the industry and closely monitoring these developments, um, looking at technology, watching guidelines. I urge you to stay ahead of the scope of practice by being engaged in medical literature and submitting your comments, particularly now as the practice guidelines are emerging to USTSPF so that they can be um, totaled and we can all weigh on these together and determine what the best course of follow through for our patients to prevent this disease. Again, thank you again. With that, we will now take your questions. I'm reviewing some of the questions in the comment field, and I think I'm going to go ahead and start by uh, just summarizing a few of them. The first one was, will the recording of the webinar be available online for viewing and sharing with the colleagues? I actually typed that in in between the speakers' conversations. The answer is yes, the recording will be available on our website. Um, so go to the ASCP's website. Shortly after, we will have a link posted for you. Uh, and once the link is ready, uh, give us a day or so, we will put it also out on our social media channels. So feel free to go and review this again and share this with your constituents, your colleagues, and um, to help all of us increase our educational prowess. Uh, another question was, can you describe the ACOG guidelines for cervical screening? And what is the age to start screening? And I think I'm gonna toss this over to you, Dr. Stevenson. Sure. Um, so we start screening at age 21. Um, we do cytology only between ages 21 and 29. At age 30, um, there are three options. You can either do co-testing with HPV and cytology, um, HPV alone. Well, that would be every five years, HPV alone every five years or cytology alone every three years. And that's from 30 to 65. Okay. Uh, the next question I'm going to ask Dr. Davey to respond to, and that is, should screening stop at the age of 65, given the high number of cervical cancers in elderly women? Okay, so the age of stopping at 65 is only in women who have been well screened, who have documented negative screening histories. Um, for example, a negative co-test, two negative co-tests in the last 10 years. And also, those women should not have had a high-grade lesion or cancer. So screening continues um, if for women that have been treated for a high-grade lesion or cancer. And that recommendation is to continue screening for at least 25 years. And you, we certainly see older women who have cervical cancer. Most of those women don't really have documented prior screening. So that's the difference. It's, could you develop it? Yes, but it's very unlikely to develop an invasive cancer at that age if you've been screened regularly during your lifetime and have it cause significant morbidity and mortality. So I think that screening history is really, really important. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's see, the next question uh, is, I'll take it, and that is how can individuals get more involved in providing feedback on the United States Preventative Task Force's 
uh, draft guidelines. Um, and these came out last fall, um, but we encourage you to go on to the website, on to the USCSPS website, and uh, we'll have that posted here in the comment section. Uh, as you see, it's just been posted. Uh, and please go on to that website and it'll, you can sign up for alerts. Uh, those alerts will give you advance notice on when the guidelines will become available for comment. The comment period has not started, but if you go on and sign up now, you will get the alerts when the comment period is open. And we're gonna, you know, we encourage all of you to stay engaged with your specialist societies as well as we will all be communicating with each other regarding these guidelines. Um, the interdependence upon all of our organizations to support each other during this comment period is critical. So we want you to emphasize the importance of submitting your comments. Please do submit. This is an important time in the history of our patients. All right, the next question is, what are the vaccination rates in the United States compared to other countries? Uh, how about Dr. Wheeler? Uh, sure. So, yeah, I think it's an important question because I think as we're looking at new guidelines and, and talking about adoption of HPV primary screening, you'll probably notice that um, the countries that have outside of the U.S. that have basically adopted HPV primary um, at, 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 at a higher incidence are those that have higher vaccination rates. So if you look at the U.S., it's going to vary state to state, but on average, and this is going to um, some of the latest data I've seen that was around 2018 timeframe, it's like between 65 and 70% um, would be considered vaccinated in the US. And that criteria that they use is at least one dose. And we know that um, depending on the regimen that you received, it may have been a two dose or three dose. So one dose um, is, is the minimum criteria. Um, and then when you compare that, say to um, the UK or Australia, where you see HPV primary adoption, um, it's over 80%. Um, and, you know, talking about Australia, I think is a good one to point out. Um, they recently adopted an HPV primary uh, algorithm. They've had a very successful HPV vaccination program since 2007. And it was because they made it a free vaccination process for young women 12 to 13. And a year later adopted young males, I think was what we need to focus on in the US as well. Um, and so they are over 80% adoption being fully vaccinated uh, with two to three doses. So they're at a much higher tier than we are currently in the US, unfortunately. And I think that's obviously one of the reasons why the ACOG practice advisory was really focusing on promoting providers to continue to push the envelope on, you know, getting patients to uh, adopt vaccination, which is ultimately going to have the greatest effect on lowering cervical cancer incidence for us here in the U.S. And so do you assume that once the uptake of vaccination becomes more prevalent across this country or more in line with the rest of the world, um, for whatever reason it's not, and we can go into that or we cannot, but for what it's worth, do you assume that at some point these guidelines will reflect that? I mean, will the ACOG guidelines have a standard set for vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Women? Absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, once the HPV prevalence is significantly lowered, um, I think we can start to look at um, having a more liberal guideline. And depending on the proportion of the population that's vaccinated, that may mean two separate lines of, uh, of guideline for um, the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Um, when you look at Australia with their success that they've had in their program, they've already shown like a 50% reduction um, in women in their later teens, early 20s uh, of CIN2 or greater. And I think when we start to see that in the US, I think we can start looking at, at the guidelines. And from, the, from Dr. Murthy or Dr. Stevenson, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think there'll be differential guidelines for vaccinated versus unvaccinated patients? Um, I think it's still gonna be too soon to know if there will be different guidelines. For those who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated, um, it's expected to take many years before we'll see um, a high enough rate of vaccination across the population to actually impact cervical cancer guidance. Um, I think in addition, at least in the first couple of years after achieving that high rate of vaccination, there'll still be challenges with confirming patient history. 
And so it still would be difficult to implement a differentiated route. I think it's going to take a number of years and we definitely would have to see um, really high rates of vaccination and, and hopefully full series, not just minimal one dose series before we can um, have differential guideline screenings. Dr. Stevenson. Um, no, I agree, nothing to add. Um, but I, I do think eventually if we can get the vaccination rates um, up, having a different uh, screening algorithm does make sense. But like, and the, like you said, we have yeah. a lot to go. And of course, you know, Dr. Wheeler, you were describing the data the, um, that's predominantly coming from overseas at this point in time. Of course, all data that's used in the United States guides are, is used for guidelines um, and the promulgation thereof. Um, so clearly we need more data on the number of vaccinated patients over a longitudinal period of time. And hopefully there are no breakthrough cases like there are with COVID. Okay, so next is the conversation that I, I think is interesting around um, <clears throat> how we could, um, how access to screening, um, you know, in the United States versus other countries, since we're gonna talk about this, um, how does access to screening differ in our country versus those countries that have a national healthcare system. And what concerns with this approach and the guidelines and the implications of the guidelines are there? Dr. Davey, what do you think? Well, I think we have some, some women that are screened a lot, maybe more than they need to be. And we have some women that are not screened at all. And we still find certainly that uh, a good share of our invasive cancers develop in women with inadequate screening. So in many countries like Australia, which is, you know, got some amazing uh, national data sets um, on, you know, they store evidence of screening and results and so forth. And there's some of the European countries and they have callback systems. Um, uh, so this national, database is very, very helpful in preventing uh, disparities in who's screened and who's not. And I think here it's just people switch out healthcare providers, they switch health insurance, um, they may not have insurance. And so um, it's really, it's really haphazard. And a lot of the women um, that get cancer haven't been screened enough. I welcome any other thoughts. I don't have any figures, but I just know that we are still missing a good share of women. Let's ask the gynecologists about their their um, their opinion on the uh, you know access to screening differentials in our country. Um, I agree with everything Dr. Davies said. One thing I did want to add though was that some health systems within the United States have a really good um, like surveillance. Um, uh, method where they are pretty persistent about following up with patients um, in terms of like abnormal PAPs um, and reminding them. So I think that would be something that would be really helpful after the access, but also um, just to remind patients and make it like a, a combined effort so that patients are aware of, of what needs to happen. Dr. Murphy, you had anything to add? Yeah, I think I just want to remind everyone that we still have millions and millions of people um, who have no insurance coverage. And accessing health care can be quite expensive. Um, even with the Affordable Care Act and its Medicaid expansion, we have pockets of the country where there actually wasn't enough Medicaid expansion, thereby leaving many patients with inadequate access to care. Um, until we can get a system where um, everyone has access to some sort of health insurance, um, which would then also alleviate, um, sorry, which would um, ensure that everyone has coverage and everyone has access to basic health care, um, as well as a good system for callbacks and reminders and uh, follow-up as well as surveillance. Um, we, Things are, things are not going to change or will be slow to change. Okay. All right. So um, what about from a clinical perspective? There's a question that um, can you summarize, you know, main concerns with HPV primary or advantages with HPV primary? So let's ask Dr. Davey or Dr. Willer to do a little compare and contrast about any concerns you have with primary testing. 
I think we mentioned a lot of them. I'll let Dr. Wheeler add that I think we, we definitely, for high-grade lesions, it's probably around 10% variable results and, and even higher results for invasive cancers. We don't really know if some of these are due to other HPV types, if the HPV was there and it's gone, if they're truly HPV negative cancers, or it's a, a testing analysis situation. I think it could be a mix, but um, though that's the biggest reason for me the opportunistic screening we've already talked about. Um, so with less than optimal screening, when you do get women in, you want to have the best single test. And to me, co-testing um, is additive. And then, um, you know, we didn't mention some of the HPV testing platforms that we have in the United States are not yet approved for that use. And they're still, you know, they're still very good testing methods. So I think there's a lot of confusion there. And Dr. Wheeler wants to add more, but those are some of the big ones for me. You know, I would just say, you know, on the HPV primary side, I think the advantage that, you know, the positive there is, you know, there are areas, there are places where we need increased access to care. Um, and, you know, I think you had mentioned before about the USPSTF guidelines around choice and then ACOG and ACCP had kind of, you know, aligned with them around choice. And I think that's one of the reasons is we have a choice of, you know, several different you know, pretty good cervical cancer screening strategies. We can all, you know, obviously in, in this panel, we probably would all agree co-testing is, is preferred, but at the same time, I think, you know, choice is important. And I think, you know, the, I think in certain areas where you need to expand access to care, perhaps where there's not great cytology infrastructure, um, I think HPV primary is going to be very important in perhaps self-collection and things like that will be very important to, for access to screening. That being said, I think for most large community practices with good access to, to laboratories, which have cytology infrastructure, I think we've all talked about the contribution of cytology. You know, just from a data point that I would mention is, you know, I had mentioned um, our review in Quest Labs that uh, Dr. Kaufman published on, uh, and uh, where I had mentioned that, you know, the a false negative rate uh, for high-grade lesions uh, was uh, only 2.4% for um, uh, the HPV primary, which is great. I mean, that's a very high sensitivity, but yet it got down to 0.3% when you added PAP. Um, and so, you know, I just, you know, continue to say that HPV primary has its merits, but it ultimately is, you know, not going to be as sensitive as the co-testing strategy in an age group of women 30 and above where we worry about cancer the most. And so uh, from that perspective, I would always prefer a co-test. And, you know, the College of American Pathologists commented on the ACS guideline when they prefer HPV primary, and they specifically mentioned that we really need more time to investigate these, these um, uh, false negative HPV results um, on, you know, these advanced lesions and cancers. Um, and I agree. And I think one thing that wasn't mentioned, I think, in some of the cases was you know, we're really talking about HPV DNA testing with our FDA-approved test for primary screen. There is no FDA-approved mRNA-based HPV test for primary screen as yet, but I think that's data that we need to, to look into because we know mRNA goes up as the lesion advances um, where DNA goes down. And so, you know, perhaps there's potential for alternative testing in the future where there is a primary screen where at least we don't have to worry about missing some of these advanced lesions and cancers. And so, you know, I think it's just, you know, more learning, more data to come around that. Yeah, there's, I mean, go ahead, please. No, I was just gonna say, I think for HPV primary screening in areas where you just don't have access to cytology or people really prefer self-testing, I think that could be advantageous, but that's, that's one of the main re reasons I see it is if they wouldn't come in otherwise, but they would do self-testing. And there's you know, always to come. Yeah. Yeah. There's always a lot of questions um, when we speak around the world about one size fits all for testing. It just doesn't, it, 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 there isn't a one size fits all answer. Uh, it's based on the epidemiology, it's based on the public um, you know, uptake of, of access, it's based on access to testing. There's so many variables in, uh, in terms of uh, being able to. Uh, at least make a recommendation for what's the best approach from a public health standpoint. And I think that's worth discussing um, because from uh, our colleagues who might be in parts of the world where access is clearly just a laboratory technology, 
or lack, lack access to laboratorians to do diagnostic testing where a public health um, perspective might be better to shift towards a different um, um, screening protocol. So let's not uh, assume one size fits all. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, we uh, have about eight more minutes left in our program here today. So um, let's uh, move on to um, a question about the real world data around HPV negative disease um, in the United States. So the question was, given that there is an abundance of real world data showing HPV negative disease in the United States, why isn't this data included for guideline considerations? What about you, Dr. Davey? Well, um, several organizations and my and you know, I, I personally also commented that we hope that the US Preventive Service Task Force will consider these. I do, um, you know, the American Cancer Study and the 2018 US Preventive Service Task Force specifically looked at some random, uh, some um, kind of systematic reviews that concentrated on randomized control studies, um, cohort studies, and modeling, decision analysis types of things. And so they were concentrating, they felt that that was the strongest data and that's what they, they often use. And so a lot of retrospective um, studies were excluded. Anyone else wants to comment? That's kind of it in a nutshell. Okay, um, got another question here. I'll, I'll, this is the pathologist uh, question. So I asked Dr. Wheeler to comment on this one. How can we reach the primary care providers who have not assimilated co-testing into their practices or are still doing ask us reflux? So, and I assume they mean ask us reflux in still in the 30 and above um, Correct. Uh, age group. And, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously educational programs like this um, and participating um, is, is very important. I think at the local community level, um, you know, like our lab, you know, we have a commercial force and they obviously visit providers. Um, they can see, you know, on their database on what kind of screen the providers are doing and to bring in uh, pathologists and, you know, maybe do a lunch program or, you know, local educational programs is important. And then I always say, you know, as a pathologist, every case is an opportunity. Um, you know, some of the cases that I presented today, uh, you know, I had mentioned that, you know, it was the kind of case where perhaps it was a missed disease or it was an advanced lesion. I'm calling those providers back um, and that starts the discussion. Um, and those are an opportunity to say, hey, you know, Perhaps if we would have, if you would have done, you know, two tests instead of one in this particular case may have caught this disease or, you know, it just leads into that discussion. Um, and, you know, the provider thinks, you know, I'm going to start doing things differently um, because of because of this particular case. So I think every case, every callback that we do is an opportunity to to have that discussion with the, the provider. So I certainly learn a lot from providers when I talk to them. And I think we can really add a lot uh, for them as well. So um, that's what I would say about how we have that, that, that outreach. Okay, there's uh, also a question in the, the diagnostic area that either you or Dr. Davey could, uh, could discuss. And that is, can you talk a little bit more about the data for glandular lesions uh, or glandular cancers in a bit more detail? Uh, the question is, is co-testing at this point, more sensitive than HPV primary or cytology primary, or what's your opinion about the sensitivity of, of diagnostics for both, both AIS and, and adenocarcinoma of the endocervix? I mean, I can provide a little bit of background. I mean, certainly glandular disease is what we're really concerned about because uh, we know that these are lesions that I mentioned in some of the Kate's examples. Uh, may not be visible easily on colposcopy, be high up in the canal. Um, we worry about capturing them on cytology. Um, and if we look at adenocarcinoma, like historically, uh, for probably a host of reasons, not all completely identified, um, adenocarcinoma is up around 35% or so over the last uh, 40 years. So since the 1970s, if you single out adenocarcinomas, it's on the rise. So it is the lesions we worry about missing. Um, and one thing I didn't mention when we talked about some of the, the studies from UPMC and the Coffin study at Quest, there um, we were talking about false negative uh, HPVs 
on or HPV negative cancers, we were talking about all comers. They actually went back in those two studies and they pulled out just the adenocarcinomas. And like, if I talk about the Dr. Kaufman study, um, there was an overall HPV negative rate in the cancers of 23%, but that went to 39% when you looked at only adenocarcinomas. So for whatever reason, that phenomenon is happening at a higher rate in adenocarcinoma as well. So, um, you know, it is significant. And so you definitely want to have that second test added on. And when they looked at the miss on those cancers, they were always able to reduce that miss by over half. Uh, when they actually added the PAP into that. So co-testing absolutely outperforms um, all other strategies when it comes to uh, adenocarcinomas. And so, um, Diane, I don't know if you have anything more to add. Okay. And uh, we'll have one final question before we need to close up here this evening. And again, I want to thank all of our panelists for an incredible, uh, your incredible commentary and sharing your expertise with us. Uh, We'll wrap up here in a few minutes, but the last actually can go for anybody in the panel. And that is our, and maybe we should start with our gynecologist first. Are, are you seeing an increase in disease in your opinion based on your professional career? Um, or are you seeing an increase in disease um, because of the screen intervals increasing in the last five years? Or do you have data to, to, to correlate that at this point? Um, I don't have any data, but just, well, anecdotally, I don't feel like I've seen an increase in disease with the, um, with the increased interval of five years. Okay. And Dr. Murthy. Um, I, I would have to agree. I don't have any firm data to support my thoughts, but um, <clears throat> just in my personal experience, I think I've seen more women miss opportunities. And so you know, it's one thing to have a missed opportunity from one to two years, but now you're going from three to five to six to 10 years. I think we may end up seeing more. It's just, I see more missed appointments than intensive intensity of disease, but I can't support that with anything other than anecdotal yeah. experience. Dr. Wheeler or Dr. Davey? I mean, I, I would add that, um, I think that's interesting to hear um, from their practices, which are based on co-testing. And so it's kind of nice to hear that, you know, they're not seeing uh, increased disease when they're at a five-year interval, but they're also co-testing. So those patients are getting the benefit of the two tests. Um, I would say that, um, you know, uh, it's hard for me as a pathologist to, you know, say, oh, this, you know, to know what the interval was that I was looking at a, at a certain test. Um, but just like I said, as I mentioned um, earlier in the in, in the in the in the webinar, um, we do have data that has looked particularly from 2012 on as to increase cervical cancer incidence when we expanded or preferred the five year interval. And indeed, it's been a, like I mentioned before, a two to three percent year over year increase from 2012 until now. So we do know that. The increased risk we knew we were adding into guidelines. Walter Kinney even did a review, uh, you know, published an article around that and mentioned that knowing that they were going to increase risk actually has turned out to be an increased cervical cancer instance. And so, you know, you could argue over the exact reasons, whether it's, you know, allowing so much time between tests or is it we're losing on the compliance side for patients coming in for care. And I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, but certainly it is inching up. Um, and I think intervals are definitely playing a role in that. Well, again, I'd like to thank all of you for an extremely uh, prophetic conversation today. I hope the, uh, the, the audience has enjoyed this. As I told you earlier, our, our uh, goal is to make sure we get this posted to the website as soon as possible. And for the questions we were not able to get to, uh, we will do our best to get those posts as well to the website. So please uh, check back for those who are signed in. Don't forget this just January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. So we all are custodians of this message. It's all of our jobs to make sure we spread the word about access, spread the word about the importance of testing, and spread the word about getting the right test for the right patient at the right time. For all of you, thank you. Have a great evening and look forward to our next conversation. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.